so Mary's been in Africa for what, 18 years? Working on this project. Um, she, she, a long time ago, got a BS uh, at Michigan State in zoology. And then uh, as she started developing this program in Africa that she's gonna tell you about, she went to Yale and got her master's degree, and that's been helping her do all kinds of great work in Africa for 18 years. And I'm gonna turn it over to Mary. Thank you, Mary. All the new people who haven't heard me before for showing up before the lecture series starts. I'm not nice, I do this to Gretchen every year. Um, <laughs> but um, also to the people who came back to hear me again. So like she said, my, my name is Mary Weikstra and I have been in Kenya since 2001. But prior to that, I also did some work in Madagascar and some work in Namibia in Southern Africa. Um, so I, I had a background for a few years before I started living in Kenya. Um, my project is called Action for Cheetahs in Kenya, but it was co-founded by Dr. Lori Marker from the Cheetah Conservation Fund. So my first six years of work was done under the Cheetah Conservation Fund. And then I partnered up with the Kenya Wildlife Service and the little logo in the middle over there is the University of Nairobi um, to, to get the technical support that we needed. And when the Cheetah Conservation Fund funding kind of started to dry up, and I needed to start seeking funding on my own, I decided to form my own organization. So Action for Cheetahs in Kenya is the organization that I formed, but because we do so much more than just cheetahs, we actually registered the organization as Carnivores, Livelihoods, and Landscapes. And last year, a second cheetah project came under our umbrella, which is the Mara Mara Cheetah Project. So I'm gonna be talking a bit about both projects today. So this is Carnivores, Livelihoods, and Landscapes, and like I said, we registered it in 2009. Um, the mission of CALL, again, I kind of said this already before I started flipping slides. Um, the mission of CALL is to be able to link carnivore programs. Um, again, more than just cheetahs, because even what we do as a cheetah conservation organization, I'll show you things about hyenas and lions and leopards as we go through this as well. Um, but we wanted to make sure that other students or people wanting to form a project in Kenya had something to fall under with the regulations in Kenya. Um, people who are just coming to do short-term things do not necessarily have the ability to like register their project, but yet we are required to like pay fair wages and sign our, our staff up for, um, for all of the taxes and things that need to be paid, just like here if somebody was coming to research here. And so with Kenya moving into that direction, organizations need an umbrella under which to fall. Action for Cheetahs is still mainly focused on cheetahs, and as you can see, it is also not just cheetahs, it is all about people as well. So I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit as I go through this presentation about how the communities help us with cheetah conservation, um, and the dog on the side, how scat dogs are saving cheetahs. Um, so I'll, I'll get more into that. Um, our objectives with Action for Cheetahs in Kenya are to do the research and monitoring on the cheetahs and understanding how cheetahs' health and habitat selection affect their survival, but also to mitigate conflict um, for natural resources because all of these animals need to compete with people's livelihood, which is livestock, in order to survive. So we do a lot of climate change with water usage, with land usage, with restoration projects as well. Um, because people have to live with the wildlife in order for the wildlife to survive. So all of our research gives a science base to what we do and then brings it back to an administrative level with conservation managers, with local communities, and even with the government. Um, and that's probably number four is something that I didn't sign up for because I'm not good with people, um, but is something that's really important that we don't just collect data, <coughs> analyze data, and write a paper, but we have to bring that back into the into the management of these animals as well. So I've done some questionnaires with the groups of people that I work with, with my staff and with the communities, and I've asked them of these sustainable development goals, you know, what do you think we address in our work in Kenya? And I was quite happy that they actually identified that we work against poverty, that we work with, with um, I can't read it down there, good health and well-being and gender equality because we have programs for women and youth and men and boys and young ladies in our projects um, that, we, that we help to reduce inequalities. We, we work with, with, with um, re responsible consumption. Um, we do a waste management project with our communities. 
um, climate action, the land on life, and also they all recognize that we work with a lot of partners. And so that we're not working alone in what we do. We work with them, we work with the government, we work with other NGOs. The Mar Marachita Project has a, a little bit different goals than what we do because they're focused inside of national parks and reserves. And so she's doing behavioral research. I get very jealous of my friend Elena, who actually does get to see cheetahs pretty much every day in her life. She's also doing acoustical research, which is the study of the vocalizations, the sounds that cheetah families make to each other, that male and females make when they want to mate, when the, when the mom is calling her cubs. She has a series of, of recording devices that she can hear all the different sounds that cheetahs make to each other that we can't hear from sitting in our cars or even if you're there, they do have vocalizations that are at a lower sound level and a higher sound level than humans can hear. So she's soon going to be publishing a paper about that. What we were working with even before the Mara Marachita Project joined Carnivores, livelihoods, and Landscapes is we've been working on genetic analysis, parasitology, and hormone work. Um, and so Elena's scat, the fecal samples that she collects, she actually gets to see the cheetahs produce those fecal samples and I'll tell you how we find the others in a few minutes. Um, but again, she, she collected over 300 scats in about three years period, and we're the ones that are working with her to analyze the genetics and to work at the Kenya Wildlife Service in parasitology and hormone, which is basically the reproductive status. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the cheetah itself for people who don't know that much about the cheetah. Um, the cheetah's scientific name is Asinonyx rubatus, and the Asinonyx part basically means a claw that does not move because cheetahs have semi-retractable claws, unlike a dog whose claws are fully out all the time, and a cat who can retract those claws into a sheep, the cheetahs come and go just a little bit, so their track always actually has a claw mark in it, and that's how we distinguish a cheetah, cheetah track from other cats. The jubatus part means maned or mantled, and that stems from the baby cheetahs that look a lot like a, a kind of aggressive little animal called a honey badger. Have any of you heard of a honey badger? I'm sure you've mostly all seen the videos on YouTube, right? Um, the honey badger can be an animal that will not tolerate being attacked by other, other predators, and, and it can be quite vicious. And so when the baby resembles a honey badger, most of the small carnivores will leave those babies alone. Um, and that's what we believe is the, the adaptation that the cubs have and why they have that furry mantle that when you see them in black and white, which is how most animals can see, um, those, those babies look like a little honey badger. The cheetahs are adapted for speed. Does anyone know how fast a cheetah can go? About 70 miles per hour. And how quickly can they reach that speed? Under 60 seconds. A little less than three seconds. Now I've always said that the, um, the Maserati car is the only car, sorry, the Ferrari car is the only car that humans have created. I was informed at my last presentation a few days, a, a couple weeks ago, for the, the Tesla car can accelerate at that rate now too. So we've created two things that can accelerate at the same thing, and they're both cars on wheels. So the cheetah's acceleration rate comes from its ability to have a flexible spine. You can see how the spine can go in both directions a very loose limb attachment that allows those legs to pretty much just fly, the claws that they have, and very rough foot pads. They also have extremely large nostrils, lungs, and a heart that gets that oxygen into their body and into their muscles to keep that acceleration. But they can only maintain that before they run out of breath for about 400 meters. So a little less than a quarter of a mile. They can run at that speed and then they're exhausted. So a cheetah can make a kill 50% of the time from when they start to try to make a kill, they actually do make that kill. Lions and leopards are only between 25 and 30% of the time. So they're very effective hunters. They don't start a kill unless they're pretty sure they're gonna get it. The problem is they lose about 50% of their kills to other predators. And that's been going on as long as studies have been done about cheetahs. Um, and that is part of the reason why cheetahs do not live in high densities where other predators are common. The cheetahs do move out into the communities where those predators are more rare. <clears throat> Their social structure is that they have a lifespan between typically seven to ten years. The female is usually solitary, raising cubs. 
However, we are now starting to see sometimes that females do actually join another female with babies, and they will stay together for a few weeks to a few months. Male coalitions are usually brothers. Those brothers have been raised together, or sometimes it's a, it's a couple of males that were raised by a female that lives in close proximity. We have one group of cheetahs that Elaine is watching in the Masai Mara, who they're completely, as far as we can tell, unrelated to each other, and that's the first time that type of coalition has been documented. Our genetics are being looked at right now to find out if maybe they have the same fathers. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit more about that genetic stuff in a couple of minutes. I'm not gonna go into that and repeat myself. Um, they also typically do diurnal hunting, meaning that they hunt in the daylight time, but in the early morning and the, and the late evening, just before the sun goes down. And like I said, they're weak compared to the other predators. Okay, so the cheetahs are declining across their entire range. Um, in the early 1900s, when the first kind of documentation was done about maybe where they were, there was an estimate of about 100,000 cheetahs across Africa and into Asia and even India. But now, there's only about 7,000 cheetahs left in the wild, with one tiny, tiny little population left in Iran, and the rest of them only found on the African continent. I decided to base myself in the Eastern African area because that is the second largest population. Namibia down here on the bottom is the largest population and the Cheetah Conservation Fund was already based down there. So I learned from them and then moved into East Africa to start this project. It is estimated that the cheetahs are declining at a rate of about 2.1% per year. If that continues, the cheetahs will be extinct in our lifetime and that's why we knew that we had to do something to make a difference. So when I started out there, I looked at where the cheetahs were living according to all the studies that have been done, and it looked a lot like cheetahs were very pocketed in their populations across Kenya, and we knew that we needed to try to find out if this estimate of cheetahs were the same, or if we were having the same type of decline as what they were having in the other countries. So we completed a national cheetah survey, which we did between 2004 and 2006, and we did find that we estimated between 1,200 and 1,400 which actually means that between the 1980s and 2004, there was not a decline in cheetahs according to the other researcher. However, when I really started looking at how she conducted her research, we did a lot more detailed analysis by physically going to a lot more places. She looked inside of the parks, and our studies and her studies both felt that there is a higher population of cheetahs outside of the park. So we're repeating that National Cheetah Survey now so that we can look at whether that trend is correct or not, and whether or not we have a stable population. The other good news that we found during that survey is that there's a lot of connectivity between the cheetah population. And this is what our new genetic studies are going to confirm, is how well connected genetically these populations are. Um, because in some of the southern African populations, they're not connected to each other, so you physically have to move cheetahs around in order to keep the inbreeding coefficient down so that the cheetahs can find mates and breed with ones that they're not related to. So we do think that in Kenya they can find each other. <coughs> I went to New Orleans and got a cough. Um, what, can, can you it, say what you, you meant by um, that they can find each other? It means that males and females can find each other to breed and that, that we believe that their breeding goes at an extensive rate Hopeful. not just a pocketed population, yeah. Um, so after we finished the national survey, we knew that the buffer areas where there's a lot of human development were the most important places to have projects. So our study showed the Kenya Wildlife Service who they should be giving permits to, but we based ourselves, this one that says Salama and Abi Kapiti is one of our study sites. The other study site is the Maybai study site up there. Elena works in the Masai Mara, which is down in the south, and then in the central population, in the Meru population. There are three other cheetah projects that are affiliated with the Kenya Wildlife Service, and one is, a, is the outside of the Masai Mara and overlaps slightly with, with what Elena is doing. The other one is in the Sabo National Park, which is Kenya's largest national park. And then another one is in the Laikipia area, just a little bit south of where our Maybai study site is. We also advise two um, community conservancies who use their rangers to collect data, 
And so we've trained their rangers on identifying differences between predators and what kind of data can help us, um, as well as collecting more fecal samples for us. Um, so those are the areas in Kenya where we work. Elena has set up a really neat database and a way of being able to identify cheetahs from the time that they're four months old until they're fully adults. And these spot patterns on a cheetah's legs, by the way, if every person could have spots on their face, I could really tell you the difference between you. But I'm horrible with faces and names. So I do look for spots myself. And I get these patterns in it. Um, and now with, with Elena's study showing how these cheetahs maintain those spots, their tail might change slightly. Um, but this is the same female when she was four months old to when she's an adult. And you can kind of start to see those patterns. Elena has identified 180 different cheetahs in the Masai Mara over the course between 2001 using photographs from tourists and, and people submitting photographs until now. So of course all of those cheetahs are not still alive, but we know who the mother is and who the cubs are and who those cubs are to those grandchildren and great-grandchildren. So she's got a pedigree that shows that there's a kinship of about 85%, and that's a pretty high kinship for any of you who work with Species Survival Plan meaning that they are on the verge of being a little bit more inbred than what we would like them to be. We will get a little more information now that we're analyzing the scat. Um, he's, he's done all of the work in isolating the DNA from cheetah. Scat is poop, by the way, fecal material. So he's done all of the isolation of the genes of the DNA, and it's been sent down to Namibia where they're doing the sequencing, which will give us a 100% um, pedigree of all the cheetahs um, in the Masai Mara, and that will be used as the baseline for the national study. The lifespan of the cheetah, if you remember earlier, I said is generally the published results say that seven to ten years is how long a wild cheetah will live. What Elena has been able to find from these photographs from other tourists and, and um, naturalists, she's got a cheetah of this, a, a cheetah of this picture, a picture of this cheetah in 2001 as an adult and again in 2011. And because she already had cubs, we were estimating her to be a little over two years old, meaning that she lived to be 13. And Elena is finding a lot of females in the Masai Mara actually living to be 11 to 13 years old, which is good. Um, male cheetahs are not living quite as long, but that is because the male cheetahs um, tend to have a smaller range and they do fight for occupancy. Um, so the, what we've done in the country is we've divided up these land use types in order to help us to figure out where the threats of the cheetah population are and where we can have an impact on cheetahs. And so Elena's focused on national parks and reserves, and I focus mostly on commercial ranches, subsistence farming, which is mixed crops and livestock, and then pastoral communities. What we have found is that infrastructure development, um, retaliation for livestock losses, the pet trade and diseases are what are most highly impacting the cheetahs. So when you look at what's happening with the landscape, when I first moved into an area, this was the view from nearby my research site. And over time, highways are going in, which is called linear development, and that's blocking corridors. Also, fences, but also railways are another thing that are going in high-speed rail to be able to transport people more efficiently across parts of Africa. And with all of that does um, come what is, what is a break in how the cheetah population can move between each other. That's why this genetic study is so important. Um, the traditional livelihood of people in Kenya has been cattle, but is shifting a lot because goats and sheep are cheaper to maintain. Camels handle the the drought conditions a little bit better, so the, the cattle numbers are going down, goats and sheep are going up, and when it comes to a conflict species, goats and sheep are more easily killed by cheetahs. Sometimes it's working, sometimes it's not. Um, also, the land use change means that they're also changing to other agricultural practices with some of the modern developments of irrigation and fertilization and different types of drought-resistant crops which is not very conducive to wildlife moving through an area where there are crops. Um, and so this, this actually shows how Kenya is kind of being cut in half. 
but we are seeing that cheetahs do have some adaptations. In both our radio collared cheetahs and in the, the cheetahs that Elena is lucky enough to see, I'm, I'm glad I get to get her pictures, um, <laughs> that we have seen that cheetahs actually swim. When we, I was an exhibit designer for so long, and when cheetahs were put into exhibits, we would put a moat with water that cheetahs did not ever swim across. But in the wild, cheetahs do swim. And giraffes will walk up really steep areas that we use in zoos to stop giraffes from moving around. So we know that they're adapting to people's land uses by crossing rivers that they used to not cross in the past. We've also seen more cheetahs hunting at night. Again, both my radio collar data and, and Elena's observational data has seen cheetahs that are making kills in the dark. Cheetahs have the same number of rods and cones in their eyes to what humans do. So we know that cheetahs can see in color, but they don't see well in the dark. So the fact that they're hunting at night when nobody's out grazing and or when the tourists are inside um, means that the cheetahs are also adapting to um, the influences of humans. So our Salama base is actually an area that is under pretty intense land subdivision, and that is our, our subsistence farming area. Um, we started our base there in, in, we started working there in 2007, but we built our base there in 2009. Our cheetah numbers between 2007 and 2015 dropped from having 29 adult cheetahs down to two. And I was about ready to close that site because I didn't think there was anything that we could do that would bring cheetahs back into the area. But my staff said, let's keep trying, let's keep educating, let's keep working with these communities. We now have seven adult cheetahs and we've had three groups of cubs born in the last two years. Those youngsters have moved out, um, but it does mean that we're having a big impact and I'm glad I didn't close the area. Um, and also, we have extended some of our studies into some of the commercial ranches that are out to the side. And it doesn't appear, we've never heard of any cheetahs getting killed by people, so we know that the cheetahs have moved into some of these commercial ranches as well. Um, and this is, this is basically what the whole study area looks like. The farms that are down in the bottom half have been almost completely subdivided now, but there are still those five to seven cheetahs at a time that are moving through that bottom area. There's about 25 cheetahs that live in the top half, which is commercial ranches that are not subdivided. And what's really influencing this area is that little red triangle that's in the middle. And that is an information and technology center that's being built into a university, a big hospital, and they want it to be the Silicon Valley of Kenya. And so what we're trying to do with all of these neighboring ranches is to make sure that the government holds true to their promise that they will maintain wildlife corridors around this technical city, which is really hard because as development comes, people want to live closer to that city. Um, so that's, that's been our big challenge in this area, is, is how, to, how to make people want to keep that. The linear development that I was talking about earlier with the railway um, includes also a lot of fences. Close your eyes. Um, <laughs> and we've had a total of 20 cheetahs hit by car on the highway. Now this has had a huge impact. Remember I told you we had a population of 29 adults. These are not targeted killings, these are accidental, um, but it's having a really big impact on the population in that area. And I actually just came from Sacramento to a linear development conference um, where we're talking about those kind of problems all over the world and how do we now begin to target our, our managers, our engineers, our our parliament or our congressmen to say that we need to remember to think about the corridors for wildlife movement as this kind of development happens. Our other field base up in Samburu, um, we did the 2010 is when we really started working up in that area and we built our campsite there in 2015. I have this nice little tent on the top of the roof of the building which I really enjoy. Um, but I have a really happy story from this area. This is a pastoral community, pastoralists are nomadic, and in the past, because they saw a cheetah as a threat to their goats and sheep, the warriors, if they found baby cheetahs, they would kill them. And one evening, one of my staff members got a phone call from a, a warrior that was in a panic, and he said, the rain is coming, and there are these baby cheetahs that I just found that are inside 
of what you guys here call an arroyo, what we call a wash or a lugga, I found these babies that are in there, they're going to drown. You have to do something. Now, this would have been unheard of 10 years ago for them to say, I want to save these cheetahs, right? So my staff person went there. He looked at it. He called me on the phone. He goes, these guys want me to move these babies, but I don't think it's going to rain that hard. And I said, you use your judgment, and if you think they should stay there, you leave them there because it's better that you don't touch them. In the morning, he came, and he found that. So the warriors are now helping us to save the cheetahs rather than killing them. And that, I believe, is because of these guys who live and work in Samburu, um, and they are the ones who talk to the community and who develop our projects for community development that give benefits to the community from developing tourism and from keeping the wildlife in their area. So our study area up there is this section down at the bottom. Just in the last two years, we've expanded. There's an actual hill escarpment that runs right through there. Um, and on the other side of the hill, it wasn't very secure in the past. But with training rangers and working with the community conservancy there, where they are seeing the benefits of having tourism come into their area, of having a wildlife balanced ecosystem, they have put rangers up in the north and it's now safe enough for people to go up there. Um, so the community also sees the development of a community conservancy as a sense of security as well. Our research staff are trained in conducting interviews and collecting data, so they become, their capacity is built in the country so they can become conservation leaders. So they can take the science that we're learning and use that to make decisions and share that information back with the community again. One of our conflict mitigation things that we're doing is a flashing light. And this flashing light is a deterrent. How many of you have ever had a flashlight shine in your face? And what happens to your eyes, what happens to your vision when that light gets shined in your face? You pretty much go black. So do the predators. So what we found is a flashing light at the right height and the right brightness will actually stop livestock by 95% from getting killed by predators. And we started out with this flashing system up on the left here. And you can kind of see that there's a little wire that was running along from one to the other. We had a solar panel and a battery and a flashing unit that was inside of people's boma, which is their house area. Um, and that was then strung out along the outside. Between four to six months, all of our flashing lights began to stop flashing. And what we realized is the bright sun during the day was actually eroding the wires, and therefore it was stopping the electricity from flowing to the lights. So being smarter than the sun, we decided to bury those wires. When we buried those wires, we thought, now we figured it out. But the naked mole rats had other choices. <laughs> the naked mole rats began to chew on the wires, and again, after about four to six months, the light stopped flashing. So I had heard about an organization, and a friend of mine helped me to get these lights that are the yellow ones on the other side, and those are called fox lights, which are used in Australia to stop bears and wolves from attacking sheep herds when the babies are being born. So in Australia, what they do is they put it out during the birthing season, and then they put it away, so the wolves never really get used to the lights. When we put these up in the, in the people's homesteads, from a distance, it looks like there's a car or a motorcycle driving around. They flash white lights, and then they flash red lights, and then blue lights. Um, and so from a distance, it looks like there's a lot of activity. And using these kind of camera traps that are down at the bottom, we found an 85% reduction in livestock losses when we use the fox lights. But the guys in the bonus are saying 85% isn't enough. We want that 95%. So one of my friends, who is the one who had developed the system on the top, actually got a grant to go to China, and he was able to get them to help him put together a system that could be used and have the same bright light, but have its own individual um, solar panel, shut off during the day to charge, turn on at night by itself. Um, and we put those ones up, but if you see those little bulbs that are there, the older men in Kenya do a lot of chewing tobacco, you know, the tobacco they stick in your lip. And that made a really good thing to carry their chewing tobacco. So they took those little light fixtures off. They hung them around their neck as a, as a, as a necklace so they could put their chew in really quickly. Um, so we said, OK, let's be smarter than your average mazé. And we started putting silicone, or an epoxy mix, actually, um, onto the lights and found, hey, it works just as good without those. And then nobody tampers with the lights. 
So now, I keep forgetting to put the new light fixture in. Michael has now gotten the whole box system designed so that it's actually not jury rigged together, but that it's actually been, been manufactured as one unit. And he has built himself a business, a Kenyan who built himself a business to now help people protect their livestock. Um, we also found that those farmers that we visited, and we told them there's a hole in your, in your fence around your, around your livestock, and they're like, no, we just fixed that hole the other day. We actually caught hyenas who were carrying branches away from the outside of the boma after somebody fixed it. And when you looked at how they were carrying them, all these, bone, all these branches, you can see, have a lot of really big thorns, right? But in order to carry it and to push that into the fence, you have to cut off the thorns on the handle part. You have to make yourself something to hold on to. The hyenas were grabbing where the people grabbed the branches. So it was as simple as saying, let's turn it around the other direction. And we made some, some branches with some bees. And you turn it around and then you push it in. So there's nothing that the hyenas can grab onto in those places where they, where they had pulled some of the stuff apart. So all of this was a good thing with communities and our wildlife rangers working together to come up with solutions to human wildlife conflict. This, I believe, is the reason that that warrior called us, is because we stopped livestock from being attacked. Now, if we do too much of that, we're going to end up looking like a big runway through all of Africa that you're going to see from the satellites. So we are trying to figure out now what are the other alternatives. We, we put a temporary solution. We're also doing a long-term study with that, looking at whether or not the predators begin to get used to those lights after a while, because we won't know that for like four or five years. But as of right now, with three years of having those lights up, it is still a 95% reduction in livestock losses. So we're taking all this information, and we need to put that into materials that can be used by other organizations as well. So we're developing school materials, which are being approved now by the Kenya Curriculum Development, that we can now disperse these school materials to all the schools in Kenya. You have to have that little stamp of approval by the government in order to do that. And we've taken all of the things that our, that our wildlife rangers go out and share with the community on how to investigate a livestock loss and what measures to put together. We had a Colorado State student in both of these cases. It was a Colorado State student that came and worked with a Kenyan student to put these materials into something that we've printed and we can now do trainings with. So the conflict mitigation toolkit is, is all of the materials that our guys use. We also do stuff with the kids with, with what we call footballs. Um, you guys call them soccer balls. Um, and getting the kids together to play sports gives us a venue to be talking to the kids who may not be going to school and to begin sharing with them environmental caretaking. So we do tree planting, we do water erosion things, and, and all of those kind of events. And now we're doing a um, solid waste management. What is your responsible as an individual youth in not littering and also helping to clean up litter areas. Um, and that's, that's the sports that makes that link to those youth. The next national survey has to be done in order for us to see whether or not there is still a decline happening in the cheetah population and whether or not the, the toolkits that we're using are being effective. So this shows where all the national parks are and where our projects are and where the cheetah connectivity is and we prioritize those areas. Where's what? Where's ACK? Um, where is ACK? What, this is, what is ACK? ACK Action for Cheetahs in Kenya. Yeah. Um, so this survey will help us to identify and classify all the threats that currently still exist and then to put all of that into an action to prevent um, the cheetahs from continuing to decline. One of the things we found out as we were doing this is that um, people in these areas do not vaccinate their dogs for rabies. Rabies can be spread into people and can be spread into other wildlife and into other livestock. Um, so we began with a survey to find out how many people did vaccinate and we started a vaccination campaign for rabies. If you can vaccinate 70% of the dogs in a community, you can eliminate human rabies from existing. In Kenya, 2,000 people die per year. Um, and so this is also a big community benefit to try to keep people from getting bitten by dogs with rabies and to make sure that people understand where rabies comes from. It is 60% of the people who die from rabies in Kenya are under the age of 15, and most of these are dog bites. So our way of addressing this is to actually 
do the rabies vaccination campaigns. And so far, we've, like I said, we've vaccinated about 2,000. This year, we're partnering with one of our neighbors, the Owasso Lions Project, and we're going to be extending, and we hope to vaccinate 3,000 dogs. We're adding in sterilization and distemper vaccinations as well. Um, so we're going to be trying to do sterilization of about 200 dogs in each area. We use dogs for something different, and our dogs in Kenya are actually trained to find cheetah poop. So this shirt that I'm wearing right here says scat dog saving cheetahs. This is Maddie, one of our scat dogs. And Maddie, in 15 field trips, has found 100 cheetah poops. We had staff for two and a half years, and they found 300, but only 10% of those came from cheetah. 100% of what Maddie found was cheetah. It's a much more effective way of doing that. We actually have two dogs doing this project. In addition to the shirts, we have stickers. These are Maddie and Warrior, and, and our scat dog project is what is going to allow us to be able to map genetics across the whole country. Um, we just now got two little Malinois puppies. So now we have four dogs, and these, these are Persephone and Artemis. Their father's name was Zeus. Yeah. Um, so, Perse this is right before I left. If you want to talk about hard to leave home when you have these cute little guys. But I have a wonderful staff of dog trainers that are the ones that are training these guys. And they look like big dogs now, but they're still very cute. Persephone and. Yeah, Percy and Artie is, is what their kind of nicknames are. Um, so, these are the next generation of scat dogs that we have. Um, and, and they're, they're turning out to be really good. In addition to training dogs, we also pride ourselves in the fact that we also train people. Um, we have had over, 20, over 15 master's degrees of both Kenyan and international students, about 31 college interns, including three of them that are in the audience today. There are three Humboldt University students that are here that actually came out and worked with us um, last year for, how long were you those, five weeks, six weeks? Yeah. Um, so if anybody does want to talk to them about you know what they did and, and how they got out there and all that stuff, um, please do. Um, and then we've had well over 50 volunteers, and annually we're reaching about 3,000 Kenya students, so about 30,000 elementary and high school students. Our staff are also being used to train other rangers. In this case, um, they are they are working with a, a poison group with. Um, not poisoning dead livestock to try to kill predators because it's also killing vultures. And so they were trained to be trainers on helping with these poison workshops in our community. Um, somebody earlier was asking when, if we ever get to raise baby cheetahs. Um, this is one of our students, one of our interns named Adelaide, who is our education student. And we did get issued with a baby cheetah that we were helping somebody raise and Adelaide got that wonderful opportunity. Um, sad but wonderful opportunity to be with the baby. The story behind those babies is that with that infrastructure development to the railway, um, there was a mother cheetah who looked like she was probably trying to come into our side of the railway but couldn't get across and settled in a community of Maasai people. And in that particular area, she was killing livestock every day. So the warriors actually went out and killed the mother. And we received a call from another ranger. Actually, it was Michael. This is the same guy who's developing the, the flashing lights. This is Michael. Um, Michael called us and said, can you send some of your staff with me? I've just heard that somebody's killed a mother cheetah and that there are babies that are being hunted with dogs. We actually found six little baby cheetahs. Um, those are the six of them. And a couple of them, sorry, a couple of them actually had dog bites. And so they weren't bad, they didn't need stitches, but 14 days after we got the babies, they started to develop really bad diarrhea and some vomiting, and it turns out that they had contracted canine distemper. We did not, where we were raising these babies, we did not have a full capacity vet clinic where we could do as much as we wanted to. We lost five of the six babies. But one of the babies named Blake has survived. This was actually a year ago, and she's a full-grown adult right now. But Blake can now be an ambassador to her species and talk about using, using Blake as an ambassador. What are the threats to cheetahs and what are we doing to address those threats? 
Um, Blake actually now has a companion, a little male cheetah cub as well. Um, actually, that, the male cub is the one that, that Adelaide was raising. And his name is Timu, which means teams or teamwork. Um, Timu was found in a market center where somebody had found a baby cheetah and thought they would try to sell it into the pet trade. So between the two of them, they actually represent all the threats to cheetahs in the entire population. And what we've also realized is I've been avoiding trying to build a cheetah center for a long time. I wanted to say I can do it in the wild without needing a center, but the Kenya Wildlife Service has actually been asking for our help in raising baby cheetahs. And we have now realized that over the next year, we're going to be trying to start fundraising and organizing to make a cheetah center for orphans like these that we can do hopefully experiments with trying to get cheetahs back into the wild, but that we can develop a center where tourists and students and, and people can come and study these cheetahs um, and be able to use these babies as the full ambassadors to talk about what their threats are and what our solutions can be. Um, so I am now starting the process. Kenya Wildlife Service has given us permission. We've been offered several sites of land on which to start building. So our next part is developing the budget and starting to do fundraising to raise enough money to put in a good vet clinic and a place where these babies can be raised. This is Blake shortly after her brothers and sisters passed away. And this is Timu running out to greet. You can't see Blake in the distance, but this is them um, out playing in the field together. Blake and Timu both wear a radio collar and they are in a, um, it's a rhino sanctuary, so they are in big open areas. They're not in tiny little cages. So how can you guys make a difference? Um, I believe that you guys have, through your zookeeper chapter, you do a bowling for rhinos? Yes. Or an event similar to it? Yeah? Participate in bowling for rhinos. Action for Cheetahs in Kenya gets 8% of what you raise. Um, so that not only helps rhinos, but also helps cheetahs. Organizing talks like what we have, but if anybody is ever interested in actually hosting another fundraiser before or after my talk, please talk to Gretchen. Um, and it would be nice to have, you know, a, a real a, a fundraiser in addition to it. Also, by purchasing the calendars, the books, the balls. By the way, if you purchase a ball, one ball gets given to a school. Um, so we have only the small balls here, but we have a link to our online site where you can purchase one of the larger balls as well. Um, purchasing the cool crafts, all of these crafts that Holly's out here selling are made in Kenya and we have some of those crafts also that your, the Sequoia Park Zoo buys and, and resells here so they also go back into contributing. So buy those kind of products when you go into the, into the shops. There's also travel opportunities that you can travel with us. We do take volunteers anywhere from two weeks to three months but we also have an adventure safari that goes where you spend four days at each of our each of our facilities and four days on safari and there's a flyer out there about the adventure safari as well um, students that are interested in projects talk to destiny and the others about being able to find the connection to be able to come out and do a project with us also what you do on a daily basis makes a big difference for conservation so doing reducing reusing and recycling um, helps local conservation and spread the word with that as well. Donating funds to conservation projects. Um, make sure that you look at projects that work with communities because without the communities, we can't save a species. And learn more about predator conservation. Um, so our voice is the cheetah's future. And I think for those of you who have been here before, I've talked about Noreen. Noreen is, was a master student that did our first diet study using cheetah fecal material and she's the one who's analyzing and doing her PhD now. So Noreen is one of the people who are the future of conservation in Kenya. And all of these voices make a big difference for what we're doing. I want to say thank you to all the institutions that do support our project and open it up for questions. I'm not sure how long I've talked, but you've been a great audience, so I've talked and talked and talked. Um, so thank you for attending tonight as well. No, every cheetah spots are different and they do not match from one side to another. Um, there are approximately 3,000 cheetahs, 3,000 spots on a cheetah's body and every single one is unique.
Um, even their tail strikes and that amount of white on their tail, it's all different. Um, pet tree. The pet trade. So, so like this cub, Timu, that we had, um, pet trade follows the same trade roots as what ivory and rhino horn do. And the cubs are taken up into the Middle East where they are used by um, the Arab community as pets. And we have been working with Kenya Wildlife Service and Cheetah Conservation Fund and a few other organizations, the, the National Cheetah Strategy for Cheetah Survival, um, on looking at how, how much impact that trade is having. And it had gone down a lot, but now with road infrastructure and better travel and the ability to hide those cubs, the trade we think is going up quite a bit. Right now, the Cheetah Conservation Fund is working in Somaliland, where they actually have almost 30 cubs that have been confiscated against pet trade. And they believe they're hitting only about 1% of what's going into the trade. Yeah, so, so it is bad right now. Um, but all we can do is keep working in partnerships to try to find where those cubs are coming from and get better law enforcement in those areas. Yeah. Do some of the big uh, organizations like World Wildlife uh, assist you in any way? So World Wildlife Fund and um, the African Fund for Wildlife, um, yeah, African Wildlife Foundation, AWF, they have grants and I have, my students have received grants from them, um, but they don't just like hand out funds. Even the government, um, the government of Kenya gives us support in different ways like the veterinarians from the Kenya government come and help us and we don't have to pay them when we do rabies vaccination campaigns, but they don't give cash. Um, all of the financial support that I get comes from grants through zoos, from individuals, and from bowling for rhinos. Yeah. Do cheetahs ever attack or kill humans? And if so, how often does that happen? Um, attacking is very rare. The cheetah has to be sick or cornered. There is no case in all of Africa of a cheetah killing a person. Um, so they're, they're a very docile animal, which has also been a part of why they're in the pet trade, yeah. is because they kind of are like having a dog that isn't trained to not pee and everything. Um, so people want them as pets. <coughs> Sorry. People want them as pets, therefore they're in the pet trade. All the way back, if you look at pictures of Cleopatra, she had pets of, of cheetahs. She has a cheetah sitting on either side. So cheetahs have been used as pets for centuries and centuries. Um, and and the, the wealthy people driving around in Porsches put a cheetah on the seat next to them and they're considered wealthy. Yeah. <laughs> yes, in the back. I was reading a letter to the editor that was commenting on an article about genetic uniformity in cheetahs and how dangerous it was and what not, not that whether it was a uh, genetic bottleneck in some kind of history or what. And the letter to the editor expressed the idea that this is a perfectly natural thing for a specialized uh, population, a specialized animal, a cheetah, that all the genes have to work together to produce this animal and there's, there's no mechanism to, to vary away from it. Uh, shoot from the hip, does that make sense? <coughs> Sorry. It does. Um, cheetahs are more than 99% identical, the equivalent of human twins. And we do believe that historically there were two bottlenecks. So at the same time when a lot of other animals were reduced down to a very low number, which was the Ice Age, when like rhinos and everything else like that got the genetics that they have, that was one point when cheetahs' genetics were very, very reduced. The second time we believe was during the time of, of the Tsars and Caesars that used to use cheetahs in a sport, the sport called coursing. And at that time in India, they were taking massive numbers of cheetahs out of the wild and not able to breed very many. Akbar the Great was only able to get one cub out of over 3,000 cheetahs that he had. So we do know that there are many, many cheetahs, that there are the two genetic bottlenecks. But that is, that is something that they're saying is the reason why like rhinos have recovered and they have a, a larger diversity of genetics. But because cheetahs are so specialized, that they maintain that same genetics and there was that second inbreeding cycle that contributed to that. Yeah. Yes? What was your favorite experience when you had with cheetahs? My favorite experience with cheetahs. Um, actually, my favorite experience with cheetahs was when I was working in Namibia and there was some cheetahs that had come into the clinic there 
and they had they had been in a trap cage for a while and their feet had been burned. So they were treated and it was three males and when they recovered, I was able to be one of the people to lift up the door and let those chews be wild again. Oh, and that you. is an experience that you can never, never repeat. Thank you. Is to be able to put one back in the wild. Yeah. Yes. So is there, um, I haven't been to Kenya, is there uh, an equivalent uh, here in the U.S. in terms of um, development and wildlife, I mean like Wyoming around Jackson Hole, is it, I mean can you, is there some kind of equivalency that you can think of that I could relate to? You mean like the linear development side yes. of things? Yes. I hear in California, yeah. if, you, if you follow any of the cougar research that's going on, the same thing is happening with cougars and the highways that run through California. The right kind of overpasses and underpasses. And like I said, I just came from this conference, so a lot of stuff is fresh in my head right now. Um, one of the things that they're finding is there are certain animals, like mainly the hoofed animals, who have corridors that they move. The, the caribou, the deer, they always follow pretty much the same path. But carnivores do not. So it's very hard to find what you would call a hot spot of this is always where they're going to cross. Um, and so that's what makes them very susceptible to being get hit on many different places. Bobcats, lynx, wolves all get hit by cars too. Yeah. And so that's, that's why working together with groups of people on an international level is so important because you can learn from their studies to what you can apply to your own. Yes. Uh, you talked about your stand dogs, but not so much about livestock protection dogs. Is your program also uh, So most of you who know about the Cheetah Conservation Fund do know how they use livestock guarding dogs to protect the livestock. And they did some pretty extensive studies on how people use their dogs before they implemented that project. And when I got to Kenya, what I thought I was going to do is just re-implement and repeat the things that they did in Namibia. So one of the first studies that we did was to look at how people use their, their domestic dogs. And because there's so much communal living in the local communities in Kenya, they have a lot of dogs in a small area where they keep their livestock at night. And if you have a livestock guarding dog, the way that it works the best is when the dog is alone with the sheep and the goats. So if you have five or six of the, what we call Shenzi dogs, or the Heinz 57 dogs, that are running around in, in the area, um, they basically will bond with your livestock guarding dogs and make your livestock guarding dogs ineffective. <laughs> also, in, in Kenya, we have a very, very high, very traditional Muslim population. Muslims do believe, by tradition, that dogs are dirty, and if you get saliva on you, you have to wash yourself seven times, and so they don't touch their dogs. So if we were to try to implement livestock guarding dogs into a Muslim community of herders, they would not take very good care of their dogs. So even those that are not Muslims, what we found with the, the need for the rabies vaccination was that we really had to work a lot more with how people care for their dogs before we could implement anything with trying to introduce dogs. In Botswana, they're crossing the Anatolian dog with a local breed of dog, but the, the Kangle and the Anatolian Breeders Association does not want us to do that. They want them to stay pure. But the reason they're doing that in Botswana is because of the diseases that the local dogs have immunities to, but the Kangles and the Anatolians did not. So they were losing a lot of dogs to some of the local diseases that their local dog population doesn't get. So what they've actually found is if the dog is treated well, a regular crossbred dog can be pretty effective in the same thing. So we're still kind of working on that, how do you take care of a dog? Our dog interviews showed that people's dogs were living only three to four years. And basically a dog at age three to four is when they're reaching their peak of protecting you and your livestock. So we have to get people to take better care of their dogs first. So it's not a project I've pushed off all the way to the side, but we're, in Kenya you say poli poli, which means we're moving that way slowly. Yeah. Okay. Thank you.